Good day, everyone, and welcome to our She Says Amsterdam event on sustainable fashion and the circular economy. Um, it's brought to you tonight by Future Factor and our venue, Packhaus de Zweiger. And we're here tonight to talk about uh, the effects of uh, the fashion industry, uh, sustainable activities, and what we can do technologically and otherwise to basically improve the world that we're living in. My name is Kerry Finch, and I'm the founding partner at Future Factor. We're a communications consultancy based in Amsterdam, in Los Angeles, and in London, and we help our clients to shape and sustain a leadership position. Now, my side hustle is that seven years ago, I founded She Says Amsterdam, and we're one of more than 50 chapters globally of the award-winning She Says organization. And what's the point? We help women uh, move to the top, both in life and and in business. Everybody is welcome to attend. So welcome everyone uh, through the power of uh, online. Uh, but only those who identify as women are on stage and use their voices. So that's how it works for us. So um, we are here to talk about sustainable fashion. We've been slightly uh, kneecapped by um, COVID and safety regulations in the Netherlands, but we shall overcome. And of course, the, the event is online. We'd love to hear from you. Please do ask your questions through the Q&A button and we'll get to as many of them as we can uh, as we go on tonight. Um, do not not leave them to the end because it will be too late. You do want to speak to uh, and ask questions of some of our five speakers this evening. Now, as I said, we're here to discover ways that we can improve the fashion industry to make a better world. Can we all work with a circular economy? What does sustainability, sustainability in the fashion industry even mean uh, today and tomorrow? And we're here to talk with five experts in their fields uh, and the first uh, we'll be hearing from tonight is Mariette Hoytink. She's the founder of HTNK and the co-founder of House of Denim Foundation. We're going to be hearing from Amber J. Sloten, and she's the co-founder and the creative director at The Fabricant. Uh, Akvila Vanelita is the director of Stones at Now Watch. Rosemary Rauchrock is a, an expert in sustainability and fashion and she works at the city of Amsterdam, at uh, Gemeente Amsterdam. And last but certainly not least is Melissa Weingarden, and she is the co-founder of Project CC. Now, welcome everybody. I'm sure everybody in the audience is giving you a big round of applause, and so they should. Uh, we're gonna hear from our speakers one by one due to the way that COVID is affecting uh, our, the way that we're working this evening. No problem, we'll be able to ask lots of questions, and hopefully we'll have a round of questions with with everyone at the end. But firstly, let's start with our first speaker, and that is Mariette Hoytink. As I said, she's the co-founder of the House of Denim Foundation and also the founder of HTNK, and that's Amsterdam's premier multidisciplinary full-service creative business development agency. That, my friends, is quite the mouthful. She'll be able to talk about what she does and why she's doing it way better than I can ever introduce her. Mariette, over to you. Thank you so much, Gary. Um, well, tonight I'm gonna to talk about my side hustle as well, because uh, this is what this is all about. Um, don't have to introduce myself. I think Gary did a great job. So this is what I do. And this is what people think my life is. Here I am at Amsterdam Fashion Week, sitting next to the journalist of the biggest newspaper and Diane Parnay. And But actually, I want to talk about, because this is where I met my partner in crime, James Feinhoff, and we started something 
a couple of years ago. So in the last 15 to 20 years, Amsterdam developed as a fashion city, but at the same time we have this crazy thing and that we have the biggest density of denim companies in the world in and around Amsterdam. So we're definitely not the biggest, but we have the biggest density of companies. These are some of the examples in which a lot of them, they have their design and development done here in Amsterdam. So it's pretty cool. At the same time, when James and me met, this was in the 2006, 7, 8, we already talked about, well, there's a lot going on in fashion, but there's not so much attention to sustainability and it needs innovation and energy. So companies were already working on certain things, there are good examples, uh, but at the same time, you see it's a fragmented industry. So from plant to pant, which is basically everything you see there is uh, a fragmented um, industry with mills and factories etc who all have their own agenda and that run their own company so there's also for the biggest business which is denim there's no there was no education so you have academies of art you have textile schools you have commercial schools but no attention to denim Knowing it's a severely polluting industry, so from water to chemicals to a pair of pants traveling 10,000 kilometers to end up at the shelf for 1995, it's definitely not a sustainable world. Um, this is Adriano Goldschmidt. He's our industry guru. And uh, he, well, what he says is completely right. The world needs food and water and not another pair of blue jeans. But what if we would make the change here in Amsterdam? This is what James and me thought when he was running Fashion Week. So so we have amazing opportunities and big ugly challenges but this is in a way what we like and where we connect so we sat down with industry experts and we came to that we need a brighter blue drier cleaner and smarter more local and connected reuse repair recycle so this was 2009 and we are, we're already talking about all these topics um, Introducing the House of Denim. This is how it started. James won the I Prize, which is an important prize in Amsterdam for putting fashion on the map. I was the speaker at uh, this ceremony. This was our former mayor, uh, Mr. Cohen. And he said, you know, I'm going to resign as director of Fashion Week, start a, a, a Frontier, which is a strategy agency. And at the same time, I'm going to start a foundation with her, with me. And he said, we're going to shake up the denim world. And I was said, OK, I'm in. So this is still, our foundation is still four people at a kitchen table. Some examples of our international advisory boards. We have a lot more, of course, but it's a small organization. We advocate the good, we collaborate for the better, and we educate the best. Towards a brighter blue, that's our mantra. I would love to have this tattoo on my arm. Towards a brighter blue, we are working towards. What does it consist of? A network of events of denim heads and the industry. We're connecting the dots uh, in Holland and abroad. So basically we flew all over the world and we just told the story of Amsterdam and anyone around the world who is in the denim industry, they said, okay, we completely get it. Why not make uh, Amsterdam the denim capital? So we flew to Delhi, did events there with the industry. We went to China, to Japan, to LA, to uh, South America. And the biggest challenge was to get everyone from the, the brands in Amsterdam, so the CEOs around the table. So we basically asked our mayor, Mr. Ebert van der Laan, to invite them all for breakfast, and they all came. Uh, we got Kingpins, the denim fabric trade show, to come to Amsterdam, which means that the suppliers, who are the innovators of our industry, they are all together in Amsterdam and the brands are the guests. So it's a super cool event, twice a year. I would love to talk hours about this conference, which I did with only women speakers and uh, all the results on that. Maybe we can get back to that, but it was cool. Women in the Indigo universe. Um, and it's about the school. We started the first and only jean school in the world together with the ROC of Amsterdam. And we basically focus on craftsmanship, sustainability and innovation from day one. It's super linked to the industry. And we train denim developers with real skills. So I think we're training a lot of people who, on management level, but we don't actually train people with skills. 
When we did the pilot, we already had an article in the New York Times. Everyone thought we already had a school. So we got applications from all over the world, which was fun. And at the same time, we started the International Gene School. Then we started Denim City because everyone said, where's your office? James was living, living next door to the Halle. Uh, this was empty for 25 years. We rented the space. And Denim City is the first denim innovation campus in the world in which you have consumers who can buy sustainable jeans, students who can study on sustainability and denim, and we have a lab, etc. This is the workshop. Uh, we also have an archive. This is Tommy Hilfiger giving his favorite pen to us, which was not a Tommy jeans, but a Levi's. This is Mark Rutte giving his favorite jeans. Uh, we're supported by the fabric mills uh, from all over the world, who are the most sustainable ones. We have master classes from people like Jason Denham. Uh, we have a lab with ozone and laser technology. Uh, we have international people coming over. This is Susie Menkes. Uh, we're in magazines, Forbes magazine, wearing the pants in a men's world. We do denim days. We do New York denim days. Uh, we did global denim awards and we signed partnerships. This is with our king and queen. I thought I was getting married and then the king and queen are our uh, witnesses. We do super cool couture things with denim. So for example, now with Ronald van der Kemp, we did a whole collection with Jean School students um, uh, coming up with new innovations for him. And basically, House of Denim is circularity. It's collaboration. We work together. We do a lot of different things. It's our side hustle. We have Denim City, and last year we opened Denim City Sao Paulo. So we have a second Denim City, four times as big, not here but in Brazil. So next trip I'm going to make is to Brazil. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. And what a whistle-stop tour. And frankly, you met Susie Menkes. Please come over and join me uh, quickly for some questions. Um, Obviously, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing the Towards a Brighter Blue tattooed on your arm in, 20, in 2022. Um, in order to, uh, you know, uh, in order to get there, um, why is denim such an important fabric, do you think, when it comes to sustainability and circularity? Because in a way, it starts with the cotton plant. And mm. yes, we have alternatives, so we can talk for hours about all the alter alternatives you have. But basically, if you start there, you can al already start with the seed and then with spinning, weaving, etc. The whole process can be sustainable and the whole process can be circular. So, but it's just a matter of all these different companies who have to be connected on a certain topic. So where is the problem? So if, if, it, if you make it sound so the easy, no, the problem, but where is, where is the basic problem? The problem is that in the end, the buyer who's, who works for the brand, basically, uh, well, they cut the price. So I, I can <laughs> say this really nicely, but that's just the way Let's it is. Because as a consumer, well, your jeans when you were young was one of the most expensive things you, you had to buy. So I'm, I'm wearing one which is 30 years old, which is still super good. So something we did along the line is less quality and more quantity, and then okay. So fast fashion has a lot to answer for, basically. Yeah, well, yes, for and, sure. And, and well, where is um, uh, Denim, you know, fashion school, international jeans school, rather? Where is, where does that, what role does that play when it comes to fast fashion and educating the industry? Well, I think the students who graduate from this school, they have so much knowledge on sustainability, innovation. They have master classes from the best people in the industry who also share the things they normally cannot share. So they are ahead of the industry and they enter and they question. So it's really nice because I feel like mm. the next generation, they will basically educate the industry. And what is it that they're learning? So it's the next generation, it's in your hands, next generation, no pressure. Uh, but what is it that they're learning or what is it that they're passionate about that is, that is so important to the, to, the, to the change within the fashion industry? I think, first of all, because they really love denim. Mm. The thing is that for denim as well, it gets, the, the older it gets, it gets better yeah. even. So they love vintage pieces yeah. and they love the whole thing you can do with it. And it's also because denim can be anything. So if you 
well, if you have babies with small denim pants, and my parents still wearing jeans, and anything between from couture to super casual wear, yeah. it's such like it's the such diverse, a versatile, versatile mm -hmm. uh, uh, thing. And that's, yeah, I think for these students, it's really something. And at the same time, they're learning all these different techniques. So they can also do repairs, and they can customize, and they can... It's, it, they, they learn so many different skills. Yeah. And you talk, you mentioned vintage, you've mentioned repair. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that your own jeans that you're wearing, looking fabulous, by the <laughs> way, uh, are 30 years old. So you're reusing. Yeah. So where does reuse and repair sit within the fashion industry? Well, you know, who is, who is working in this way? Who is succeeding with that business model? Or indeed, is no one even bothering? What's the story now, well, there? Well, there are brands, some brands from day one, they already do this. So, for example, Nudie Jeans has lifelong repair the moment you buy a jeans you can repair it but it's also if you buy a better quality denim you don't need that much repair so it's more in the cheaper ones that the repairs are really there right and at the same time if you have a really good denim and you get to repair done at denim city it looks even better i so, love that yeah, so people that, can bring their you jeans, can bring your jeans folks get, bring get. your jeans come to amsterdam <laughs> there's never been a better reason come to amsterdam come to denim city yeah. get your own jeans repaired yeah. i think it's around the corner from where I live. I'll be there tomorrow. <laughs> okay, cool. Mariette, thank you so much for Welcome. now. Um, oh, do you know what? Before we move on, I'm going to take two minutes because I would love to hear more about women in the uh, Indigo, Indigo universe. Right. Tell us really quickly about that and then we'll move on to our next speaker. Really quickly, I'm going to all these seminars and it's always guys talking mm. about the business mm. and it's a, lot, it's a man's world. Yeah. And I know all the really good women in our industry. So it's super weird because they have good positions. But they're not the speakers at a con Yeah, just one or two. It's always the same. For the rest, it's all men. Mm. And I thought, what if we invite all women there and they uh, talk a about... A radical move, by the from way. Yeah, but... No, it's not radical. It's so not. It's so not, <laughs> it's so not radical, but it's not... Well, they didn't do it. So I asked them to come up with their personal vision on the future of denim. They were never asked to do that because normally they represent their company, which is kind of boring if you have all these right. presentations of companies. I asked them their personal story and also to do an introduction about themselves mm. first and then their vision on the future. The response I had when we send out the invites of men was, what are these women going to talk about? I was like, yeah, well, lip stick, nail polish, all these things. So I was quite disappointed yeah. about the reactions because I never experienced that well, okay, it's, they it's, were really it's insulting and unprofessional and bizarre, very, yeah. frankly. But I'm really inspired that you were so inspired to um, put together um, uh, an opportunity for women to gather and talk um, professionally about the business that you so love, which is denim. So yeah. I applaud you for that. Congratulations. Thank you. More of that, please. Mariette Waiting, thank you so much for now. Thank you. Uh, we're going to move on, folks, to our next speaker, and that is Amber J. Sloughton, and she's the co-founder and the creative director at The Fabricant, which is a digital fashion house that creates clothing that is always digital and never, ever physical. Hard to get your head around. She's going to explain everything. Um, her 3D animation and digital fashion design work examines the way in which we will curate our identity in the future. I love the work that this company does and that what Amber is doing right now. So um, I'm really excited to hear from you, Amber. Over to you. Hi, everyone. Um, how do you run a fashion house without producing any physical garments? And how do we create a better future for an industry that, as we know, all is incredibly pollutive? We want to create a new answer to basically be able to express ourselves endlessly within this new virtual world. And as we've seen the past sort of a year or one and a, one and a half years or two years, we live most of our lives online anyway. So at The Fabricant, we try to redefine what identity means in the future. And we try to see how we can create a new answer uh, by using technology and not having to impact the planet as much with our vanity. So we are digital only fashion house. Um, this means that we create clothes that are always digital and never ever physical. 
and um, yeah, we try to really produce a new way of exploring who you are as a human being within this digital space, but also helping companies to um, yeah create new revenue streams using these digital channels, but also try to sell uh, products digitally. Um, uh, and this resulted in us uh, creating our first collection back in the day. So. Um, I was actually the first uh, student to graduate with a full digital collection. Back then, this was absolutely crazy because nobody really understood why the hell would you combine digital, um, you know, digital with clothing? Why would you uh, combine gaming with clothing? Why would you basically put those two together? And I mean, I come from um, a background of uh, fashion design and loving identity, but. I always was a gamer as a kid, so I understood what it was like to live in these both worlds and to combine them and to explore my identity freely. And I thought that fashion was so physical, and especially in fashion school, I heard so many horrible stories of what the industry was doing. And as a young fashion designer, I felt the res responsibility to try and see if we could do things differently and work in a different way. Um, so this resulted in uh, yeah, creating our first digital-only collection, which showed in three different places uh, in the same week without having to hire any models, no photographers, no nothing needed to be shipped. Um, people could still experience this emotional feeling of looking at fashion without actually needing to be physically there at a fashion show. And this was before COVID and everything started. So we say... We waste nothing but data and exploit nothing but our imagination. And obviously, uh, data is still wastage, uh, but we try to really create with this new way of working um, to not pile onto the waste of stuff that is already there, but actually try to create new answers of clothing ourselves using tech, wearing data. It resulted in our first digital-only dress that got sold on the blockchain. This was in 2019. Um, Back then, we designed this digital-only dress that an influencer wore on her Instagram, and it got auctioned off at a conference of Ethereum, which many of you might know right now. Um, uh, maybe you've heard about blockchain, maybe you've heard the word before. It's very complex. But um, this was basically the first dress that sold on a blockchain on a conference um, for $9,500, um, which absolutely stopped the press. Like back then, this was 54 ETH. So if some of you know the value of ETH right now, that must have been a very high price because it's about $4,000 right now. So that's absolutely insane. Um, but this dress sold uh, and the whole press stopped, the whole world stopped and everybody was like, what is this? Why are we dressing ourselves with digital clothing? What does the world come to? <laughs> Um, but we just thought it was a beautiful reckoning or experiment and it showed that we no longer need to buy all these clothes to express ourselves. How can we use this technology if half your life is digital anyway? How could you stop basically buying all of the physical products and do everything digitally instead? And um, yeah, ever since then we've been just fascinated with the concept and with everything that we're doing on trying to create these new stories, which even resulted us being on the cover of Vogue uh, Singapore last uh, September issue. And this was the first issue of uh, Vogue uh, ever to have a digital cover. And it was also an NFT. So it sold as an NFT on OpenSea. So um, this is like a whole new industry, which is all about digital only product. And it can create new revenue streams, new wealth models, new economical models for anybody that wants to join this industry. And it's giving the agency back to the people. Because I think fashion has been longly sort of ruled by an elite few. And we really believe that it needs to become decentralized and we need to create that new future. Um, this is a collaboration that we did together with Krista Kim, who is a famous NFT artist. And with her, we designed this look, which is located in a meditative space. And she believes in a movement called techism, which is all about wellness in the digital world and how you can basically yeah, create these meditative environments uh, within a digital space. And we designed this look for her, uh, which also showed at Art Basel uh, in Miami last week, which is really cool. 
Uh, but yeah, we also sell all kinds of things. We try new things on how you can wear digital clothing. So this is an AR filter that we built for this drop. Um, and basically you can wear that right now. If you look for us on Instagram, on uh, Snapchat, you're actually able to wear all of our items right now, which I think is the power of what digital fashion can mean. It's immediate expression without limitations. Um, and we really see this as the fashion world 3.0 where, like I said, it's no longer about these old few that get to say or dictate what we need to wear, but it's really about us taking agency over how we want to express ourselves and earning from that and creating these new economic models. What we're creating is a studio, which is called the Fabricant Studio, where you're able to uh, create your own digital garments. You can choose a white canvas garment that you like, choose a fabric that you like, and create them together to create a new NFT that you can then wear in the metaverse. So we believe everybody can become a digital fashion designer and everybody can monetize with that. Everybody can create their own creations and create this new economic model for themselves um, to create profit for everybody because we believe a kid in Dakar sends as much chance as a kid in Paris to become an influential fashion force. And who are we to say that um, this needs to come from the big brands. We can do that ourselves as well. Um, and we believe in the grassroots movement of that. Um, so here you can see also some examples of some of our wearables, uh, because when you mint an item on our platform, you're immediately able to wear this in uh, some metaverses, from which one is Sandbox, which you can see, which is, looks very pixelated. Uh, but it is very cool because this is just what it looks like, and it's a translation of our look. So it's directly wearable in this new world, um, which is called the metaverse. Uh, but we see a lot of potential there because we believe that this really is going to create this new economic model for everyone. And um, yeah, we really truly believe that fashion no longer needs to be physical to exist. And if we don't change the way we do things right now, I think, um, yeah, we're much crazier than anybody ever called us. so much. That was fabulous and really inspiring and quite an eye-opener, I'm sure, for many people watching. Please come and join me. Please come and join me and we can have a chat. Um, you mentioned uh, digital fashion giving the industry back to the people, which I think is a really fabulous way of, of talking about what's coming next, what's fashion forward, and also, you know, leaning into the immediacy of, 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 of the industry um, and it being a great leveler. Can you talk a bit more about that? Because um, I think a lot of people in the audience would, would be really inspired to know how they can get involved. Yeah, of course. I think um, the industry is rather a top-down thing, mm -hmm. right? We have this one certain person that is deciding on what everybody should wear and nobody gets credited. So in a way, you slave away within this brand and you never get sort of credited for your hard work and people take agency or credit for the things that you create as a creator. And we really think that creativity is something that you can live from. A lot of times, like what we've seen, is that basically you are not able to earn money. As an artist, this equals poverty, mm. basically. But what NFTs do and what this whole new world of the metaverse and blockchain can do is it gives the agency back to the artists themselves and it credits everyone in the process. So if you set it up correctly, your smart contract can give you back um, money over the sales that you'll make in 10 years. And this is way different than something else that we've ever seen. So yeah, I think art no longer has to mean poverty, but you can actually earn a living of it because creativity is something beautiful and you should be paid for that. That's, yeah, and I think that's hugely inspiring. And it will inspire people to do what you did, which is take another different form of moving into the fashion in, fashion world, basically, yeah. in, a very new, uh, in a very new way. There's a question that's come in. Thank you so much for those of you who are sending questions. Keep them coming. Um, someone has asked, people are talking about the where to earn economy. What is that and how does it work? Oh, it's beautiful. I love that. Where to earn is something, a very interesting concept. Uh, basically, I think what we see right now happening is play to earn economy, which is 
um, basically that you can play a game, and if you play that game, you can earn money. Right. So you could, for instance, one of the examples is Axie Infinity, which is a game um, that is mainly played, uh, or it's played all around the world, but there's people in the Philippines, for instance, that make money off that more than any wage could ever pay them, which I think is incredibly beautiful, because mm. there you create a new economic value system. And I think where to earn could become something like that. So it's very much about how you interact with clothing. If you create um, the clothing that you want to wear in the metaverse, you know, you could sell that. You can, maybe if you wear it a couple of times, you can earn coins of that, or you could, it could become like a really playful thing that you can interact with rather than it just being, okay, I buy this garment, maybe wear it twice, you know, maybe try to sell it on the secondhand market or throw it away. But with this where to earn, you can actually incentivize things, you can gamify it, you can create new experience for people. So clothing becomes more valuable over time with whoever wears it and whoever interacts with it. Um, what about the interplay between luxury, digital fashion and sustainability? Where, talk to that a bit. And also, I'm interested to know where the, the major, more traditional fashion houses, how their viewing their own future or how you view their own future? <laughs> um, yeah, I think anybody that does not, you know, understand that the future will not be in a centralized place, I think will not exist in the next 10 years. I think it's really about understanding that the consumers are no longer consumers, they are creators themselves. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think every brand should understand that this is the world that we're moving into and um, it's no longer about just feeding people with, okay, this is what you, you, know, you should do or this is how you should behave, but it's more about enabling people to be creative and having their own creativity. So for luxury brands, I think, um, I think there is a legacy, there is the, the handwork, there is the craftsmanship, which is all very important. But I think um, going into this new world, which is actually basically the, the, the youngest youth that is now, for instance, playing Roblox or any of these games, like they care about very different things yeah. than grown-ups do. And that's the thing, like they understand virtual products like no one else. Like my cousin from nine years old, she has a couple of horses, you know, digital horses, and she loves them so dearly. Like she talks about them like they're real things, right? So like, this whole new generation is very different um, uh, from what we are used to. Yeah. And I think we need to move into that mindset of digital only, because um, I think it's not only better for us as human beings having less stuff, but also better for the planet. Let me just ask you one final question, which leans into that, which is, you know, the fabricant is pushing for a fully digital fashion industry. What does that mean, especially when I want to get up in the morning and put clothes on? Yeah, that's a very beautiful question. We see a future where there will be less and less and less physical clothing and more and more and more digital clothing. Am um, I going to be naked? This is mainly might, where you want that to question be, comes from. If you want to be. <laughs> you can say. I mean, of course. I think, like, uh, in general, we have quite a negative culture towards nudity, I have to say, um, especially as a woman, um, because I don't think sexuality is bad, but yeah. That's another question. I think that, um, in a way, what we were moved towards to is having maybe one or two items that are very comfortable, mm -hmm. that keep you warm, that are regulating your temperature, mm -hmm. that are very smart garments. And then that will be your physical attire. And over that, you'll be able to wear endless virtual garments that you'll be able to choose every single minute. Like, like kids right now, if they play a game, every single game, they choose a different skin. Yeah. And okay. that's sort of how we see the future is you'll be able to change identity however you feel like and coupling it to your feelings rather than it just being one choice you make in the morning. It could, be, could become way more of a communication mm -hmm. that is always as meant to be because um, to be fashion is communication. It's what you feel like. Brilliant. Amber J. Slota, thank you so much for now. Round thank of you. applause to the entire audience, mm -hmm. uh, from the entire audience, rather. Really, really interesting. And I think it, this kind of thinking rocks the fashion industry. And, you know, th uh, and I'm sure traditional fashion houses potentially see this, this thinking and this way forward as quite a threat. Mm. So 
it's it's brilliant to hear. Thank you, Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Let's move on to our next speaker. Agvila Varnelita is the director for Stones at Nowwatch, which is an Amsterdam-based innovation company, and it was founded last year with a mission to help every human get more from each moment in their life through their new product, which is a beautiful, I might say, uh, Now Watch product. Um, it's basically the world's first wearable, uh, and it measures a cortisol proxy, and it predicts stress response, and it restores balance for complete mind and body well-being. That's quite the product, and it's, it's a beautiful uh, piece of, uh, uh, well, let's call it jewelry on your arm. So let's hear, without further ado, from Agvila Vanelita. Thank you, and over to you. Thank you so much for the introduction, and thank you for inviting me to speak here. Um, yeah, so I am working together with the Now Watch, and we are cutting gemstones. And when we think about something which is um, a gemstone, it's a piece of nature, and that is coming from the earth. And thinking about what does that really mean, right? We are taking something from the earth, we are cutting it, and then we are wearing that. And my whole journey with this started and really connecting to the, not only to our garments, but to everything that we wear. And how do we appreciate that in the West? So people are going to the H&M or we're just buying pieces of clothing and um, we are not really appreciating anymore of who made that, where did that come from? And um, like, for example, um, we are talking about denim that over time it's become such a low quality thing that is just we are wearing it sometimes it's being washed washed and then it's being thrown away so my whole journey took me to India because I was so inspired by their art their craft their culture and everything that has to do with creating something and really taking it from ancestral wisdom from art, from expression, and from nature. So I was in India, and I was so inspired by traveling how the art and the culture is so expressive everywhere that you go, and how everything that comes from ancient expression still lives with the people today, and how that interacts within the creativity and expression of, of the culture and its beauty. Um, and in this way, I was exploring how we can work with these people and support their culture and also be like a modern contributor within the society. So working with um, an architect, Bijoy Jain from Studio Mumbai, who is a really famous architect. And he has um, an architect um, office in Mumbai where he is hiring artisans from ancient from ancient cultures how they are building with stone how they are working with clay with textiles and then combining that into a building that is really high quality so not this fast building a building that needs to be torn down and built again but how did these cultures learn how to use these materials over time and create something that lasts and then also supporting the dignity of the people that are creating. Um, Our Lady Niru Kumar, who is an Indian designer who has really revived the cloth industry in India with Kadi, with Ikat, and these garments and weaving uh, techniques that are really high quality and really last a very long time, that are also really sought after textiles in India, which are now just vintage and they're becoming lost. Um, so there is some perspective here when we are a Western, uh, Western brand and we're coming into India and then we are sort of just uh, labeling the, the people that are working there as cheap labor. You know, we are like a brand, we're coming in there, we have an assignment, maybe a big brand is working with a middleman and we are paying these people who are really masters of their crafts like 70 euro per month. You know, they are sitting in this place, they are sleeping next to their uh, workstation and they're creating something for, let's say, Dior, who are 
creating something of very high fashion and they are making it with little beads. And in the end, we are not acknowledging the person who has created this. Whereas that person has spent their life and they're probably their father and grandfather has learned this craft and they're really artists in their own right. So how can we, as designers who want to express ourselves, how can we work with these people and really give them the dignity that they deserve? So that has been my work in really connecting artists and artisans and helping them to co-create and express themselves as also human beings, but not as just this invisible person in a little room in Mumbai not being acknowledged at all for their work. So this is the reality that we are reinventing. And how can we take a different approach? So being somebody who is interested in ancient craft, who wants to implement this within our own designs, uh, being a small brand or me, for example, being hired by Now Watch, who wants to cut gemstones, how can we work together? and what has to change in our mindset in order to really come together with these people. So when we are working with them, can we look them in the eye and know that they are happy? Can we laugh with them and understand that they are really enjoying what they're doing and they're not being exploited? Like what label are we attaching to them? Are they cheap labor? Are they um, a craft person? If we understand their culture, um, or do we want to just impose ourselves on them and then give them very strict deadlines that they need to fulfill? So how are we working together and how can we reinvent this production? Um, so I worked in the last year on setting up a factory and hiring um, really craftsmen who are really masters of taking a rock from the earth and analyzing this rock and really honoring that this is something beautiful and cutting it and taking like 12 steps and 12 people and maybe even going to different villages and really honoring each and every piece of rock and piece of nature and how can we tell that story and connect to what we are in the end purchasing and also how can we collaborate and create an environment where we can offer fair wages praise and recognition for their work, health insurance, job security, co-creation, religious and cultural freedoms, which w for us, that may seem like common sense, but when you go in there in their workshop and you actually give them some piece of dignity, for them it's like such a present because this is really not so heard of. People just come and they expect them to create something and in the end they are not really praised. So um, we work with artisans and we really work with them and learn how they are creating the stones, how they are um, honoring the stone, what machines can we build to help them to work more efficiently and create those together to express themselves and really feel like they are also innovating within their tradition. So that's super interesting. And um, yeah, how can we then as still creators of garments, because also there are people who of course also want to wear clothes and we want to express ourselves as designers. How can we then source and create things that um, we can co-create with small producers? So for example, there's a woman collective Sahili women in Rajasthan or a Punjabi and a Hatta uh, project where we can connect with people who are creating small scale with craft. So, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much. Please come and join us. Um, uh, I would like to, to take a slightly different approach, or rather you have taken a slightly different approach, so I'm going to ask a slightly different question. And it's about the gem economy, which we haven't really talked about uh, and I know nothing about. Uh, what does a circular gem economy look like? How do you make such an economy sustainable yeah. and circular? Yeah, this is a huge question. That is such a baby topic within the gem industry. Mm. and. Um, yeah, it's 
maybe it starts with really thinking about the people in the mind mm -hmm. and how are the people treated where they are extracting the stone. So mm -hmm. for example, now we are cutting stones and we are really working only with Indian mines and who are lawfully certified. And uh, I have traveled to some of these mines and seen how the people are working there and understanding, okay, there's no child exploitation, there's no female exploitation. And we can start there. Then there is also, of course, the whole industry of like lab grown diamonds and but that is also not so sustainable because there's so much electricity that, that goes in mm -hmm. there so it's a whole field that it's slowly working towards and how can we then elongate also the life of mm. wearing a piece of jewelry so that also goes into like yeah. are you buying a gemstone are, are you going to pass that on through yeah. generations as well which is like a heirloom tradition yeah. so it's very, very intricate topic. Yeah. It is. It's, yeah. it's a big topic. Let me move slightly and ask you one more question, which is more about India. And yeah. now there's a lot of exploitation that goes on, it seems to me, in terms of fast fashion, using, mm. you know, production in India. This is, there seems to be a lot of exploitation. Um, so much clothing and material is produced in that country. What are some of the cultural and business shifts that you're seeing when it comes to sustainability? Are there any? Uh, is there anything positive in terms of circular economy and sustainability that you're witnessing? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I have spent really a lot of time in Jaipur, and mm -hmm. Jaipur is this center where many um, designers come there mm -hmm. to produce their clothes. And I really see that many designers are choosing for um, textiles that are really of a higher quality. So really seeking out um, like a hemp that was created in Himachal Pradesh that is sustainably grown. And mm -hmm. these um, old woven textiles like Kadi or Ikat that are really sought after now because of their longevity. So I see that coming. But then again, there is so much also um, yeah, polyester and um, so much pollution. Su super pollution. Yeah, yeah. it's 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 yeah. A, it's complicated, and it will of course take quite some time. Just quickly and finally, um, what does it mean to support local artisans? Um, what are the behaviours and expectations that need to change there? Do you think? I think that um, as a designer, really going to look for artisans that interest you in how they are expressing themselves within their craft and how can you work with them to co-create so not only like taking something of theirs and then transforming it into your own design but how can you work together with uh, the people in these small communities and then how can you really give them the credit and also the financial mm. um, support that they need to survive as well so that you're not just robbing their craft and putting it in your brand and then not giving them recognition, but really working together. There's been a question that's come through, which is about technology. Um, how can technology improve the lives of artisans in developing countries? I think definitely, for example, if we're making communities online where we're giving more of a stage to these mm -hmm. um, to these communities is definitely a part of it and giving them more um, coverage, I think is definitely true. But it is also, um, there is also counterpart too, because these cultures, they are so beautiful in their preservation, you know, in India, in Ladakh, really in the North, North Mountains, they have beautiful yak wool and they make amazing woven textiles and for example, some of that is actually being lost because they are connecting to, to technology and they're seeing, oh, this can be cheaper or this can be mixed with X, Y, Z, and then it's becoming less pure. So there is 
pluses, but there is also There's minuses. There's also minuses, yeah. yeah. Akvila Vanelita, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we mm -hmm. need to crack on. There's, there's so many ways that we can take this conversation. We have two more speakers. I'm going to move on right now to Rosemary Rauchroch, who is a sustainable fashion expert with more than 30 years experience. She knows exactly how the fashion industry works, and she has a great network of national as well as international contacts. She's currently working with the city of Amsterdam and is part of their European Reflow project. Um, let's hear uh, from Rosemarie. Thank you so much. Over to yeah. you. Thank you for having me. And lovely to hear all these stories uh, because next to Reflow project, I um, uh, invented also the platform Clean and Unique where also the artisans and makers comes together because uh, we don't need uh, competition, but we need collaboration. So but what we face now mm -hmm. and also what I hear now many times that we have so much waste and in cities around the world, we face this problem. The Reflow project uh, started two years ago in six cities and uh, every city um, sorry in every city we face a material flow we don't want to speak about waste anymore because waste is uh, raw materials so in milan we face uh, the food uh, industry and here in amsterdam uh, we uh, investigate and research the textile industry. We don't do this. We do not do this alone. We do this with all amazing partners, and also here we collaborate uh, to research how we can uh, and rethink the textile flow within a city like Amsterdam, with so many citizens, and our city is growing. So more people, more stuff they ha they have, and more waste we produce together. Where we started, first we invented a tool and it's the textile wheel and not what designers are starting with, with an idea. We start to face from uh, collecting textiles. Um, and in the city of Amsterdam, we collect um, uh, 14 kilograms. Now, uh, people would discard 14 kilograms of textiles each year per person. We have almost one million of people here in the city of Amsterdam. Cities are growing, so you can imagine how many kilograms that yearly is. But what we have to do with it? So what we did first, we investigate the complete textile wheel from the moment that citizens discard the textiles. Uh, in, in the city of Amsterdam, we have also these textile bins, uh, the containers, but we, find, uh, we uh, research also what we find in the waste. and. There's enormous um, kilograms of textile we, uh, we see there. And how we improve that citizens don't waste their textiles anymore, but uh, put it in textile bins all over Amsterdam. And then you need everyone in this uh, textile wheel and to speak with each other how we can invent a better industry from this part. Um, and then when I started, I worked, I think, two days in the city of Amsterdam, and there was COVID. And within all the borders were closed. Uh, the textile bins uh, we could not uh, close because we, as a citizen, we cleaned up our houses. So, so much stuff everywhere. And uh, we had to rent a big space in the north of Amsterdam. And we went with uh, the whole team of Reflow, we visited. And we saw with our own eyes that in within three months, there were uh, 150 tons of textiles storaged over there. Because, and this was only from the textile bins and not from the waste. So you can imagine how much textiles there is. And um, yeah, this was al already sorted out that uh, normally citizens, they put also in the textile bins, uh, iron machines, uh, hair dryers, et cetera, all this electric. But, and then you, you can do so much with it. So secondhand clothes, uh, but you can also make yarns out of it, but how to come there? So the strategy was we invented the round table discussions. We invited the ecosystem here in the city of Amsterdam. And uh, but because we have we need everyone, the creative designers, the, the citizens, but also the policy makers, the textile industry, everyone and the ecosystem 
is very good improved here. Uh, we came up at the end with a round table discussion. We, we call them the Monday laundry day. It started here at Pakhuis uh, Monday morning at the breakfast. We start to talk with all these people uh, from the industry, the governance, etc. How to come there, and we end up now with ten green deals on circular textiles we are working on, and we have to do so much more. Um, because we are working with a circular yarn innovation center with the ecosystem from Zandam and all the people here. Um, a shared repair center we are setting up now because uh, when citizens or consumers bringing back their clothes to a retailer and because they don't like it or maybe they worn it already for a party out, um, you can't sell it anymore. So it's, it's thrown away. Uh, circular workwear, um, but also a knowledge center maybe and the collaboration between everything every, and everybody who is here. But also on bed and hotel linen, uh, uh, we work together with House of Denim on the denim deal. But we need also the governance and um, a few weeks ago the governance signed a green deal on circular textile to collect better together here in the region. And also to have a higher quality of collecting, because if the higher collecting, the better you can uh, put it in the market again, uh, also on um, uh, fibers, etc. And then also we are working on an awareness uh, campaign. And we do this with the city of Amsterdam, the Amsterdam Economic uh, Board, and the metropole of uh, Amsterdam. And um, during this process, uh, we helped also um, newcomers, uh, um, people with new initiatives, uh, like the Swap Shop. Uh, this is an initiative uh, started in Amsterdam. They, you can swap clothes, but if it's not swappable, uh, we collect also and we put it also in the chain of uh, to recycle to fibers. And uh, we collaborate also with uh, part of the city of Amsterdam on the city pass. It's a pass uh, citizens can have uh, when um, they have uh, difficulty with, uh, with, with finance. And also this group, we need to involve in the circular economy. And uh, with the Stadspass, you can have at the moment, you can have a big discount to repair your clothes uh, to the tailors here in the city of Amsterdam. Um, we call this also donut uh, solutions. So we are very proud to end up with, uh, with this kind of solutions. If you want to know more, uh, of course, you can follow us on uh, the Reflow project. And uh, would, you, would you like uh, to see more? Uh, send me an email on Amsterdam at reflowproject.au. Thank you. Rosemary, thank you so much. Please come and join us at the table. Um, and at the, right now, we're going to say goodbye to our Salto TV viewers. Goodbye, goodbye. Please do follow us online. Come and join us uh, at desfeiger.nl forward slash live so uh, you don't miss the conversation. But for now, over and out to Salto TV. Rosemary, thank you so much for that. Yeah. Really fascinating. It's inspiring to hear that the city of Amsterdam is doing what sounds like quite a lot for the circular economy when it comes to fashion. Is that true? Are they, can more be done? Always, I'm sure. And how can uh, the city of Amsterdam inspire other local authorities and other governments? How, how can, you know, the circular economy spread from city or government to government? Yeah, to many questions, yeah, Rosemary. Yeah, yeah. Many of them, and uh, not all is uh, from the city of Amsterdam, but we can uh, carry all these entrepreneurs uh, who comes to the city of Amsterdam with good ideas, and uh, we can help them to find also subsidies, mm -hmm. grants, or collaboration, or to and also to connect them with the ecosystem, because I think that is the first thing mm -hmm. a uh, municipality can help. Mm -hmm. in to connect with the right person to move on. So how can another city or another uh, country um, work more closely with a circular economy? What are the first steps that, that, that they need to understand? Yeah, for me, it was very interesting to map the ecosystem mm -hmm. in this area and to see what's happening already, because 
also in the city of Amsterdam, you think that uh, people uh, who are mainly on the stage, you think, okay, there is, a, uh, I know that Denim City is well known, uh, so there are some others, but there are so many small scale uh, entrepreneurs who are doing so much work already, and to connect them all together and to learn from each other. And um, at the moment, I'm also the coordinator of the Denim deal and also to put all these stakeholders together and to learn from each other that also people who are not into the circular uh, economy yet and to want to understand, but to, like uh, Mariette also said, to uh, share your knowledge mm -hmm. without, without to think about competition, I, that's, that makes uh, the moving steps forward because the textile industry is well known to sit on their own islands and to do what mm -hmm. they want to do mm -hmm. and not sharing anything. I was also a buyer. I came in a factory. And, oh, don't say this because... And, uh, mm. So education so and collaboration so we have to open is up. important. Yeah, opening up education and collaboration. Exactly. So you mentioned that, uh, you know, we've been throwing our old clothes, our jeans, our textiles into, into the bin as it were, the collection bins. What happens next? What happens to those old products? How can I be inspired by this process? Yeah. Is it is the repair and reuse, is it a culture which is actually working? Yeah, first we have to follow the R letter. The R letter stands for uh, rethink, uh, reuse, repair, etc. And recycling is really the last thing to do in the in the cycle in the cycle mm -hmm. so f we have to encourage for long liberty on cloth that means that also quality has to uh, be better because uh, like here on the table already said the quality through the years went in, in tremendously down uh, also the polyesters are not the polyesters from the 50s and uh, the, the Terlenka <laughs> trousers you could <laughs> uh, stand up uh, you can recycle them or to wear them nowadays but nowadays also uh, it's made for five times wearing so fast fashion so, is, is and dangerously at least in the weak. fashion industry normally you think about a minimum 100 times wearing but that is not the case anymore so if we want to improve the quality and also not to blend fibers too much together because also nowadays even in recycling the best way to recycle a textile garment is when it's made for from 100 percent one material 100 percent polyester 100 percent wool 100 percent but look into labels sometimes there are five six kind of fibers all mixed you can't do anything and yes there is a coming up with uh, chemical recycling but then it's uh, chemical recycling only on polyester with cotton or so but, so, so one last there's a it, i get it it's a shit show <laughs> yeah i get it's it so one last question <laughs> before we move on to our final speaker because we're running out of time but there's <clears> so much to talk about and you folks are brilliantly interesting so one last question which has gone from my brain yes one last question which was who's getting it right is there a brand is there an organization apart from house of denim we all know how fantastic the work of mariette and, and co is but who is getting it right are there brands out there who are truly making a sea change difference um I, let's say that it's that the all are, a lot of people are trying even the fast fashion industry is trying to change are they though is they it try. really they try but the only right. only thing is that the fast fashion is uh, built on uh, quantities and uh, for me it's very interesting to see how we can uh, improve the sustainable brands in the normal shopping streets because it's all the fast fashion brands who also can afford the high rents yeah. and the, cons the, the consumer who is only going for a day to Amsterdam they only see the fast fashion brands 
and there are some brands who do some changes, but the small, beautiful fashion brands who want to do something else are not in the Kalverstraat or they are not in the city center, more, more or less. So what we are doing now in the city of Amsterdam, we are creating now a sustainable shopping route. And uh, we hopefully, in the, the week of the circular economy, in the second week of February, we are going to launch that. So I hopefully you enter into Amsterdam. So in time for Valentine's Day, we're all going to go on a exactly. route for, for circular, sustainable fashion through the city of Amsterdam. Join us. We, we're going to have hearts and flowers and happiness and love. Yes. And sustainability okay. and circularity. I'm in. I take you on the ride. We're going. Me and you. Okay. Uh, Rosemary Raukrox, thank you so much for your time. And finally, folks, we're coming, last but by no means least, to Melissa Weingarten. And she's one of three female co-founders of Project CC. And this is a search engine for fair and sustainable clothing. And the fashion tech startup has created innovative tools to bring together more than 200 sustainable web shops and more than 500 brands and it's all in one place and to hear more about that which i think is a marvelous effort um is melissa weingarden please over to you thanks a lot for the introduction and also for having me i'm really excited about all the projects especially the fabricants i was following them for a long time so it's really cool to see them but um, I'm Lisa Weingarten. I'm one of the co-founders of Project CC. I founded it together with my sister and her uh, friend, Noor Veenhoven. And um, yeah, we started it in 2016. Um, but I haven't always been an advocate for sustainable fashion. Before that time, I really used to be a shopaholic. I always wanted to buy the cheapest clothes for as, for as many clothes for as cheap as possible. Uh, for example, I remember when the first Primark came to the Netherlands, I actually went on a train ride to another city to go to that Primark and spend the whole afternoon shopping uh, as many clothes for as cheap as possible. But then I saw the documentary, The True Cost, and I was like, oh my God, with something I do for fun, I'm actually supporting uh, human exploitation and also the harm of the world. And I was like, okay, I do not want to contribute to this industry anymore. So then I stopped buying clothes for a whole year. And um, it was quite a good mindset reset as well, uh, because it makes you think about when you would actually need new things. But then at some point I kind of broke and I went into the H&M because I knew they had a conscious collection and I thought, okay, they, at least they are sustainable. And then when I walked in into their fitting rooms, I was super excited because then I also saw uh, written on their wall, we empower our garment workers to unite in unions. So I was like, okay, this place, it can't be as bad as I read before. They are probably doing better now. And I bought a lot of things and I was really happy with them. But then a few weeks later, again, they showed up in the news because they weren't paying their living wages to garment workers. And then I was like, why is it so hard to make a sustainable choice? Uh, even when you're aware of it and when you're trying to do good, it's so hard to, yeah, to find a brand that actually cares. And I was discussing this with my sister, Marcella, and she was, like, she was doing a minor programming at the time, and she was like, I can just build a website that collects all those small sustainable brands in one place, and then it becomes easier for us to find it. So we got home, uh, her friend, then her roommate as well, Noor Veenhoven, joined in. And then we spent the whole year building the website and researching brands. And then we also found out that there were so many beautiful brands, but also sustainability was used in so many different ways that it was quite hard to tell um, in what way you wanted to make an impact and in what way you were actually making an impact when supporting a brand. So with Project CC, we connect, collect all that information and all those products in one place. So for example, imagine you're looking for a new blouse. You can just go through our blouses category and browse to all the blouses that over 300 sustainable web, shop, web shops have to offer. So it's really easy to see um, how you can uh, support, uh, go the, uh, how you can support su sustainable brands that match your values. And uh, what we also really believe in is collaborating with the ecosystem. Because like all the others tonight already said, 
there's so much happening in the fashion industry and there's so many cool initiatives. So one of the things we're working with is Pixel. Pixel is also a startup and they started as in really focused on the sustainable fashion industry. And what they do, they have an image recognition tool and you can just upload a picture of any outfit you like and then we provide you with the sustainable alternatives. So it's really, there's almost no excuse to not buy sustainable. But then I'm not here to tell you that you need to buy yourself into sustainability because the most sustainable thing is the one that's already made and the one that's already in your closet. And like Rosemary already told you, there's so much waste of clothes um, that it's, e it's even more sustainable to, to extend the life uh, of your clothes that you already have. But how can you do that? So there's, nowadays there's a lot of options that you can use. Um, per personally, I really like renting and swapping, uh, especially before COVID, uh, you could easily have um, like swapping parties and it was really uh, a nice opportunity to socialize, but also to borrow and uh, swap clothes from your friends. Um, and, not, and it's also like with the swap shop, now it's not only from your friends, but also from people you don't know yet. And the other thing that I really like is renting because a lot of people say sustainable fashion, yeah, it's often quite boring in the sense that it's a lot of times it's made for uh, longevity and not really on trends. Of course, there are many brands who prove you otherwise, but another way you can handle this is by renting. And um, in Amsterdam, we have really cool renting opportunities. So we have Lena Library. And since last year, they actually have, or last week, sorry, <laughs> they actually have um, the option for, for men to rent as well. So that's really cool. And you have Borough Brand, which is uh, more on the high end. So if you're looking for, um, for clothes to go to a meeting or business attire, uh, things like that. The other thing you can do is shop secondhand because those clothes are already made and that's a good thing. But on the other hand, we do see that with shopping secondhand, it's also cheaper. And in that sense, for me personally, it really reduced um, the hurdle to buy. So what I noticed when I was switching towards sustainable fashion, I started with shopping secondhand because I was like, oh, this is, this is very cheap. And also I had the urge that it were unique pieces. So you were like, if I don't buy it now, I'm not gonna find it otherwise and I'm gonna regret it. So um, this is something that I really had to learn uh, to before I buy, take a step back and realize, okay, why am I actually shopping uh, and trying to buy something new? Do I need it? Um, but if you do, then there's Vinted, the next closet and a lot of beautiful vintage stores in Amsterdam uh, that you can just discover. Another thing that you can do to support the, uh, the sustainable fashion industry without even opening your wallet is to hold brands accountable. A lot of brands, they like to talk about how they produce, and if they don't, then you know you got something to spy on. So um, there's a lot of initiatives that organize campaigns, that collaborate, um, that unite people uh, to take action collaboratively, collaboratively. So you can do it in a group, and it sounds like it's, it's not really, um, like it's not really making an impact, but actually it is. There's uh, the Who Made My Clothes campaigns by Fashion Revolution, there's the Pay Up campaign, and you actually saw that brands listened to this because there were so many people flooding in um, that they were, um, yeah, that they tried to answer those questions. And the other thing you can do, of course, is shop sustainable. Uh, if you wanna shop sustainable, we try to make it e really easy with Project CC, so you can just filter on the labels um, on our website. But the real thing I want you to remember from this talk is the best thing to do is to buy less, choose better, and make it less. So by making the most out of your clothes and getting creative in what you can do, um, you are actually making an impact and making the fashion industry better. So thanks a lot. Melissa, thank you so much for that. I like your mantra, buy less, choose better, make it last. Um, you talked about how we as individuals can hold brands accountable. Can you uh, tell us a bit more about that and what you've done when it comes to collaborative action? 
Yeah, so um, I started actually with uh, Fashion Revolution, uh, joining their campaigns. Um, so every time around, uh, um, it's in April, I believe, when they, uh, it's in remembrance of the Rana Plaza uh, accident that happened, they um, organize a campaign and urge you to um, ask brands to um, to answer your question, who made my clothes? And what you see happening is that um, brands start answering with um, pictures of their garment workers who uh, held up like the, uh, the image saying, I made your clothes. But there's also a lot of brands who don't answer. And I think that's also really interesting. Um, and just one quick last question because uh, we're running out of time. Um, if you can if you can inspire the audience to take one action today, tomorrow, this week, this month, what would that action be? I think the most important thing I would say would be to choose one thing and focus on that. Because when I started my journey in sustainable fashion, it was super overwhelming. If you try to do one thing good, you do it bad in other things. So um, what I really tried to do was pick one subject that I really wanted to have a positive impact on. Uh, and for me, that was uh, garment worker rights. So whenever I need a new piece of clothing, I get to decide, OK, what brand can I support um, that impacts this the best? Um, thank you so much, Melissa, Aquila, Amber, Rosemary, and Mariette. You've all been really inspiring. I'm sadly out of time. I want to thank you all for giving your insights. I want to thank everybody on the She Says Leadership Committee team and everybody at Future Factor who works on She Says Amsterdam. But I want to especially thank uh, the whole team who's worked with us over the years at Packhouse de Zweiger. This is our final event here at Packhouse de Zweiger. We're needing to find a new home, and we've had just the best support ever from this uh, location. Uh, come along and get involved in the events. Tune in to um, the Packhaus des Weicher um, agenda. They truly are brilliant, and it's an absolutely brilliant cultural resource in Amsterdam. I salute you. Everybody online, thank you for sticking with us to the end. Um, hopefully see you in in 2022. Over and out.